It's my pleasure to have Svata Grims and Silvana Michekia today as a two speaker of our seminar. And the sessions speak about the childhood on the symmetry and separation of variables. Yes, yeah, so I promised to Stepan that I will give some uh, entree for him uh, on his uh, bachelor thesis. And he shall speak about his lecture on, uh, uh, he shall give a lecture on his bachelor thesis, which was defended three years ago. Uh, so the topic as was uh, taught by Ivan is separation of uh, <coughs> variables and uh, symmetries. So we were motivated by some uh, theorem, the miracles theorem, saying that uh, the separation of the Laplace operator in three dimensions happens exactly in 17th uh, coordinate systems. Yeah. So uh, first it was uh, for us important to get now what, the, what it may mean, uh, what it can mean. And the second motivation was uh, the formulation of the procedure of the, let's say heuristical procedure of separating of variables. Yeah. So if you studied some uh, <coughs> physics, you very often learn that you get an equation and then you should uh, try to find a solution in a SEPA, uh, which is a product of two functions uh, or more functions. Each of them depend on uh, some chosen set of variables which are disjoint. Um, so we were into it, yeah. So we knew uh, some literature. Uh, maybe I will write it briefly what I just said. So let us have an operator on a, a partial differential operator on a manifold. Uh, and then we would like to say that the solution, uh, that it has a separated solution. If there exists a function, let's say F, which I will change probably these signs. Uh, it has a solution, which is a product of two, functions, but I suppose that the manifold is two-dimensional for simplicity, and uh, that the solution can be written as a product of two functions, and typically uh, this shall, uh, we must specify the map towards which we took it, so there is a map. And the solution is separated. And we must say whether the first function depends uh, uh, on the first variable and the second on the second variable. But actually, this is uh, not so easy to say because we would like at the first stage, at the first stage to admit <coughs> that also this is a separated solution. Well, this is a constant. Well, this is a constant function. Yeah. So, but we cannot say uh, easily, uh, or we didn't know it at least how to formulate that constant doesn't depend on a, uh, does depend on one on one variable. If it doesn't, uh, evidently, it doesn't depend on any variable. So first, so there is a problem with this dependence and independence. So we decided to speak about uh, independence. Uh, so we say that the, separate, that the solution is separated if it is, can be written as a product such that the first function doesn't depend on the second variable and the second doesn't depend on the first. And in more variables, it can be formulated as well and so on. Yeah. So, uh, but then uh, we can have problems whether our separated solution is really uh, interesting if we have just constant solution, which is separated. But this always exists if the differential operator doesn't have uh, absolute uh, term, yes. which is actually constant is the only function which can be globally <coughs> defined. Yeah. So there was problems with triviality of the formulation of this procedure uh, of this heuristic process. So this we somehow uh, uh, we succeeded in some in some particular but quite interesting way. So we've, uh, we proved when the solution is uh, non-trivial enough and when it is separated, Shepan will speak about the details. Uh, I will go give only some brief uh, list uh, towards literature. It is uh, the first and very often cited is Steckel. I will provide the definition. Uh, provide the... I 
Yes. Good evening. This only in German. Everybody integral integration the Hamilton have to be differential quite and I will put if I will write only Hamilton have to be eighteen and ninety one. It's uh habilitation in Halle, yes, it's uh available uh from Heidelberg. Uh this is really about Hamilton Jacobi. Uh, then, then there are quite popular books for physicists, Mylar. Symmetry and separation of variables. <coughs> it is, it is a textbook. Monograph from Cambridge. So they have this classical approach closed V VR motivated by. But they are actually the definition of a separable operator and separable uh, uh, solution is missing. Also, not only according to us, but also to Corwin, uh, probably Corwin, which were given as a citation by Igor, recommended. So Corwin uh, writes. Or window. So, uh, first, uh, sorry, but uh, yes. the first book is a PC. The uh, uh, integration the Hamilton the the it is more in our sense that he formulates a, a more sophisticated uh, condition than we did. Yeah. Heinzel, maybe I will not mention. Then Benente, this is quite popular among geometers. And they are first Benente, also connected to Hamilton Jacobi. Benente, for example, DGI proceedings, it is uh, quite known for the audience. DGA uh, differential geometry application conference in and this was in Opava, as, as, as I have it here, 1992. And then uh, the uh, article of Eastwood, uh, Michael Eastwood, uh, higher symmetries of Laplace in the analysis of, uh, analysis of mathematics. And then also Costan. So these are the yeah, these are various sources. This is as I thought more uh there will be two physics, Steckel Benanti, dynamic uh Hamiltonian system and Hamilton Aircobe. Convent are trying to uh give the F um, definition to my so I guess you should have the microphone because so the Zoom uh, participants can hear you. Yeah, okay, so sorry, I was uh, told that I don't, uh, I didn't be, I have, I wasn't hurt by you. Sorry for that. It's on the blackboard written. Uh -huh. yeah. And this one is also on again. Yes. Is that okay? So I will write only this Eastwood. Ah, yeah. 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 Okay. okay. I see it. Eastwood. I have symmetries of uh, Labash and of Labash. This is a this is really about this you mentioned about the uh, uh, universal algebra approach, about the groups and universal algebra. He's trying to find the operators in a uh, 
some formal algebra of the Laplace room, doing the ambient construction. I like see. like going from sphere, if I may rephrase it, right? Going from sphere to harmonic polynomials on the ambient space, uh, rephrasing it. Uh, it's not I see. Uh, higher, but does it mean higher? Yeah? It means that the operator can have uh, arbitrary uh, finite um, uh, finite um, degree order. Yeah, I will define the definition of. Uh, it will be yeah. It will be it will be told actually. Uh, yeah. The constant maybe is mean? better to start with because constant is a simple definition. And it is in some proceedings of uh, from Lemini. Yeah. Uh, Verma modules and uh, uh, an existence of quasi invariant operators. In non commutative, non. Sorry, I will to be sure I will have a look whether it's really these three mathematician mm -hmm. constant. Oh, I didn't write it. No, probably yes. Limini 75, yeah, so lecture notes. And the higher symmetries will be explained there, yeah? so I will not say it actually. They are, it's about commuta commutation of the uh, investigated operator, research operator, up to some lower orders, you know, commuting Lee brackets. It's a uh, and this somehow generalizes a constant approach. In a sense, the approach of Myler is even, it's, yeah, uh, it's uh, even less restrictive than constant. And uh, HK, which is what? This, uh, we are HK. I have comparison here. <laughs> About the generality of separation. For the separation. So the Eastwood, if used not only for Laplace, uh, <clears throat> then this is the check. And then I wrote it in opposite order. So then uh, my layer, and then constant only for orientation of the generality, but constant has much more interesting results and so on. Yeah. So it's the generality of the separation definition of the separable operator yeah somehow so actually i think that's uh, that's everything for the interaction from me and uh, and uh, then there is this arc uh, archive I don't know, a paper, do you mention it? Archive paper. No, I didn't mention it. We wrote an archive paper on that, on the, I mean, the results of the thesis at the end of the year. Yeah. yeah. So, where one can read it. Yeah. So, the theorems and definitions will be done by Stepan. So. Yeah, yeah. That's all. Okay, I, I have my own. <laughs> okay, I hope there is no echo anymore. Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction and for this context. Now I will <clears throat> make it more technical, <laughs> uh, and I will I will prove the main theorem and also uh, give the necessary definitions <clears throat> in order to make it precise. Okay.
so maybe Okay, so I will start with some uh, trivial example that every one of you know, just to give with a feeling what we are trying to do. So the trivial example is as follows. We can consider uh, Laplace on the two-dimensional manifold R2. And the general approach goes like this. Take the Laplacian. And you suppose that the solution can be written in form uh, in the form f times g, or f depends only on x and g depends only on y. Well, <clears throat> usually now we introduce some so-called separation con uh, constant, so you obtain uh, something like <clears throat> a squared. Yeah. Okay. Just maybe remark: f is dependent on x, and g is dependent on y. So you get something like this. And you can see that uh, if you solve these two equations, it's also the solution of the original one. These solutions are kind of trivial. There's some exponential and some sinus. <clears throat> and uh, the composition of these uh, function or the product gives the solution of the original operator. So yeah, that's the general approach. <clears throat> and the point is to reduce from partial differential equation to basically ordinary differ differential equations. So this is much more easier. <clears throat> and, but uh, usually when you read the books, the definitions are sort of missing and the approach is sort of brute force. You just write it like this and you play with the expression. So we try to do it a bit more, um, more conceptual. <clears throat> and the main theorem, as will be stated in the end, gives a sufficient condition for uh, operator to have a separated, con uh, separated solution. Okay. Maybe just a small remark in the beginning. When I say that F belongs only on X, depends, sorry, and G depends only on Y, uh, we sort of mean that the function F is defined as one dimensional function and we embed it trivially into R2. So it really, at any Y, it has always the same, uh, it is always the same uh, value. Sometimes, for example, I think in Miller's, Miller's book, you may find that the dependence is only defined by the way that dy of f is zero everywhere, but this is actually not enough. It's the consequence of our definition, but it is not enough because uh, it may happen for some topological reasons that it's locally, uh, the derivation is zero, but globally it depends on Y. For example, if you consider some sort of, I don't know, uh, horseshoe neighborhood. Even if it's connected, yeah. yeah, even if it's connected. So if you consider something like a horseshoe neighborhood, I think you can imagine a functions that uh, are constant in each of these stripes and it sort of goes up. So each uh, partial derivation in this direction is zero everywhere because these are constants, but here it's different than here. So it's not just a trivial extension to R2. So this is sort of the first thing. I hope it makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now the setting. Well, uh, the algebra we are concerned with is called Okay, uh, M is some manifold, and I will write DOM for differential operators on manifold M. By this, we just mean um, the operators on functions that locally, that means if we are given some coordinate chart on M, we can write the operator, I have operator from here, then the restriction on U can be written as some, or some sort of sum. By this I, I'm multi indices, so just some partial derivations times some functions. And uh, if I write it like this, then the coefficients are uniquely determined. And there are so 
some attributes of these uh, operators. For example, I can define homogeneous operators of degree zero, these are just functions, homogeneous operators of degree one, those are just vector fields, basically. But other homogeneous operators are not well defined because if I take something which is uh, homogeneous of degree three, it doesn't have to be homogeneous in other coordinates, but for vector fields and functions, it works. Uh, also, we have some num some uh, degree of the differential operator. There's the higher derivative that comes out, and that means actually the higher symmetries. This exactly refers to this degree of the differential operator. Uh, when I define symmetries, it will be more, more clear what I mean by that. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Yes. So, what is the more general version of this statement? So, let's say instead of a. So, let's say instead of a Laplacian, I have another differential operator that mm -hmm. is a differential operator. Yeah. So, what would be the procedure for coming up with the. Uh, in, in, what would be the procedure for scouting this equation? Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's. Uh, well, that, that's the pro that's actually the, the main point, you know. Uh, in a lot of literature, it, they just introduce this k, and they play with the expression and hope that the operator factors out in a way that one uh, factor doesn't depend on y's, for example, this one, and one doesn't depend on x, and then you get these equations, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah. That's what I'm going to say. How to do it in general, like more systematically. Well, I mean, I can spoil the main theorem, which is basically that if you have a symmetry, which is actually a vector field. Uh, yeah, symmetry, I didn't define symmetry yet. Okay, so it won't make sense of it. Okay, so if you have a symmetry vector field, I will say what it means later. Uh, it actually produces coordinates because the vector field, you can take the flow and you can make the coordinates. And in, in these coordinates, you can always do this separation in some sort of canonical way, which I will show. And the actually the eigenfunctions of this vector field are the are the solutions. So you take the eigenfunctions, and those are the part of the separated uh, solution. Does that make sense? Well, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. No, sorry, I would have to think about this. Yeah, no, sure. <laughs> Please interrupt. Okay. okay, well, maybe before I define the notion of symmetry, I will define what does it mean to for uh, an operator to be a G invariant with some uh, with respect to some function G. So definition. Uh, I have, as always, some manifold, some coordinate chart P, and I have a differential operator on this coordinate chart. And I have also some G, which is smooth function on U, such that it does not depend, does not depend first k coordinates that's in the sense i mentioned above and i say that d 
is G invariant if I can write D G H equals uh, G D prime H and these functions are uh, does not depend on the last n minus k. So I basically I have a complementary set of coordinates and G depends on the first part and H depends on the second part or does not depend on the opposite part. And I have universal D prime. This is not some sort of derivation, it's just annotation. I have universal D prime for all H such that I can factor out this G. If that makes sense. Um, maybe one example where this is commonly used, it's sort of similar to that example. So for example, uh, if I take the Laplacian in two coordinates and I write it in uh, polar coordinates, it looks like this, dr squared, one over r, dr, one over r squared, theta. Okay, that's just the Laplacian written in polar coordinates. And now if I take the exponential in theta, times some, I don't know, h, which h is the function of r only. You can think about it and you can see that this exponential can be sort of taken in front of the operator, but all these, oh, there should be theta two, theta two, theta squared. <coughs> this, uh, oh, I mean, it's d theta, d theta, second derivative. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, and you can think about it and you can find out that this d theta actually sort of disappears and is replaced by this lambda if you make the uh, switch. Oh, sorry, maybe I will write it under it so it will be good. <clears throat> And here it's lambda squared. Okay, and this is the D prime. That works for each H that does depend only on R. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 sure. And actually the exponential is the eigenfunction of this d theta. And that's not a coincidence. That's just the point of the separation sort of. Okay. Uh, by the way, this d prime is not uniquely determined. I can add some d thetas because they act as zero on h. So it doesn't matter. But if I don't want any d thetas, it's sort of unique. And basically the procedure is very similar, right? You can take always you get an exponential and you can replace the d thetas by lambdas basically and it works this is actually the <clears throat> yeah and this you can write it as so so uh, so i mean it is mean that not when on first uh, variable not it depends on the median yeah that g does not depend on the first variable for so in this example yeah, yeah. Yeah, and th this doesn't depend on R, yeah. and this does not depend on theta. And also this does not depend on theta. This is basically what will uh, guarantee us later the separation. So we have the eigenfunction times some another differential equation, which is in less variables. Now we don't have the thetas. Sorry? But your definition of the separation or definition of the does not depend on What's my definition of does not depend on the first K coordinates? Uh, so, so it assumes that the D does not depend on first coordinate. Yes. And G has a such form, yeah? That means that's a true, true condition, not first condition, and G second condition on D, right? Yes. And I, I mean, it's, it's, not really, it's not really a condition on D. Uh, the condition is on, if I have, so I will formulate the definition once more. If I have a differential operator and I have some G, which is a function that does not depend on the first K, then I say that D is G invariant. Uh, G invariant. G invariant. Yes. 
if there is such d prime that this holds. Uh, that's the definition of the G invariance. Yeah. This is the definition of the G invariance. Oh. Well, I guess it does because it's just saying that you can uh, take the constants in front of the operator. Yeah, and, and yeah, oh, oh, of course. And the operator is invariant with respect to constant functions. You can say that. I'm sorry? Yeah, no, this equation should hold for all, all, all H. Yes, in particular for H. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is that clear? Uh, D prime will cross. Yes, yes, of course, of course. It's dependent. Okay, and I mean, we can formulate this sort of uh, behavior, behavior of the exponential sort of generally. I will say it as lemma. <clears throat> so if we have a differential operator, D in some neighborhood U, and D can be written, uh, I mean, it can always be written like that. <clears throat> but if these Fi's are not, uh, not dependent on x1, for example, then you can see that d is I'm it, d is uh, e lambda x1 variant. That's the same procedure as here. You just replace all the dx1s with lambdas. And since are, these coefficients don't uh, depend on x1, as in this example, it was theta, you can take the exponential out. Yes, it's like. Yes. Uh, it's depends on the chart. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, uh, depends on the chart, so you can get to uh, understand it uh, the vector field later on. Yeah? Yes, yeah, exactly. Because the vector field generates. Yes, yes, exactly. And the vector field actually by from Frobenius theorem it generates coordinates. So yeah. that's the chart in which it will be it will separate. Yeah. <clears throat> so now I will define the notion of symmetry of an operator. Yes. Well, I mean, I'm not sure if the notion of uh, G invariance was used because we came up with it when we are talking about the separation. So, but maybe it was used in different name or I don't know. But uh, this uh, thing of taking out the exponential that's generally used. This is a sort of so process. Kind of of yes, uh, exactly. Yeah, 
like characteristic data, characteristic situation. Okay. So another definition. Uh, by the way, note that the algebra of differential operators, uh, it's associative algebra. So we have the trivial commutator, making it into Lie algebra. And that's basically what the notion of symmetry is, is all about. So I, again, I have D, some differential operator. And I say that L is a symmetry of D, symmetry operator, if and only if uh, it commutes with the operator uh, up to the operator itself, which is multiplied at some other operator. Uh, this is sort of dependent on the literature. Uh, I believe that for our result, we have no constraints on G, but usually is required for G to be of uh, lesser degree than L. So if I have, for example, the vector fields, which are the first uh, first order, I require G to be just constant or a function to be precise. No, yes, I can define degree on differential operators. I can define degree as the maximum derivative, derivative yes. that is there. Yeah. No, G is also a differential operator. Um, G is also, also here. I mean, uh, it's possible to do different restrictions and you get the different notions of symmetry. So I'm pretty sure you can do things with them, but uh, for us, it's, also, it's possible to just state it this generally. Yeah, a function. <clears throat> a function, yes. Yes, exactly. Oh. Yes. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you have this sort of relation, you can see that L preserves the kernel of D. So, so it's basically the transformations of the kernel. Right. Yeah, that's a special case. I, I will call it. Yes, it's, it's very <laughs> because then g equals zero, then you have yeah. So mm. yeah, uh, I I call it a simple symmetry because it's uh, useful later. <laughs> but yeah, exactly, you have complete invariance. Okay. Uh, yeah, you, you can show that all uh, symmetry operators form only algebra. It's not difficult, but and also all operators of order one form only algebra. But for higher orders, it's uh, it doesn't have to be the case because the commutator may increase the in the the degree. So maybe just a few examples. Well, maybe one. For example, if you take mm -hmm. Helmholtz operator, you can find that all symmetries of order uh, less or equal to one. Are precisely the uh, the x dy x dy minus y dx one. So our these are all the symmetry operators of uh, degree one or lower, and this is just some trivial computation. You just write out the commutator and you find out this. But these two operators actually correspond to a separation in Cartesian coordinates. And this vector field corresponds to separation in polar coordinates. These are exactly the way you can find the coordinates in which it separates. You just compute this commutator and you get all the vector fields that provide some, in some way the coordinate separation. But uh, these are not all of them. There are some separated 
There are some coordinates uh, which provide separated solutions, but are not. Uh, but you can find them in this way. Okay. By the way, uh, if you take Uh, I believe these three are even simple. These, uh, these three are, they are even simple, I think. All of them, I guess. Yeah, all of them. And yeah, yeah, yeah. like nothing, yeah. By the way, uh, this, if you take the, this is the generators of the algebra, because as I said, the symmetry operators from formerly algebra and this Lie algebra, if you generate it, is isomorphic to uh, complexification of the Lie algebra of a Euclidean group, actually. Uh, just maybe one remark the op symmetry operation operators doesn't have to be this easy all the time. For example, if you take just uh, the Laplace. You find that there are a lot of uh, symmetry operators, namely um, each uh, operator of this form is symmetry if a plus uh, ib is a holomorphic function. So the, uh, the algebra is huge. Okay, there. Uh, this is something by computation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All this translation of the rotations so mm -hmm. and so on. Don't they, don't they, shouldn't they be, shouldn't they generate only the scope two times R2? Uh, actually, what is, uh, what is the boundary term? Because uh, I have a scope two by the uh, Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, R2. Yes. And these have done Three and you have dimension one. So you have dimension four. Yeah, I know. So um, maybe this is a conformal case as well. Yeah, so maybe you shouldn't write here formality. Yes, you, you are right. Yeah, I, I, yes, you are right. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, yes, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I wrote all the, yeah, the, the Euclidean group is only the homogeneous degree one symmetries. Uh, and the one is homogeneous of degree zero, I guess. So yeah, it's an extension. But it's homomorphic, but also, as I interrupted you, and answered, uh, but also uh, derived uh, by computation. Yeah, yeah. So the fact that it is a simple symmetry, economic, maybe it's homomorphic. Yeah, I mean, you just compute the commutator and it spits out some uh, easier differential equations, which in this case corresponds to uh, being holomorphic for this function. Yes. Actually, uh, in Laplacian, no way. Uh, Laplacian free has, uh, I computed Laplacian free and it's a tedious thing, but it's much smaller. It has, I believe it has something like eight or nine generators. It's much smaller in three dimensions, Laplace. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about general classification, but I believe that in uh, Helmholtz, if you allow order two, you get the universal enveloping of this, uh, of this Lie algebra. You have universal enveloping algebra of, of this, uh, of this Lie algebra, <laughs> I think. I'm not sure. Um, Yes, yeah, 
Exactly. So, yes. Mm -hmm. And so that is a perfect example. Is it something for? <laughs> So, so the proof example is something not so easy to does not fit to the. Uh, sure, maybe it's, um, I have a look at the proof at the end of the seventeen. Yeah, but I believe they have used the second order symmetries. I'm. So I think that's it. Uh, that's just the, the order of the operator. That uh, the commit. You take L to be of order at most two. And I'm not sure if this would require the G to be order one. I think he, he does. Mm -hmm. So you take all of these uh, symmetry operators, and he somehow manages to uh, not only classify the, uh, well, he classifies all uh, coordinates in which it separates. Uh, uh, so, so that means the definition of symmetry or the uh, guy in your definition, that means order of the operator as mm -hmm. Yeah, L. Uh, uh, in my definition, it's just order of L. Uh, for me, yes, but generally in literature, it's required that G has smaller order than L. Yes. Okay. And that's it. Okay. Okay, so maybe just two last points before I state the theorem. Uh, yes. <coughs> One. Um, I say that L generates uh, B if uh, on some neighborhood U, if D can be uh, written as um, I don't know to some K. So uh, the generation is sort of um, sort of C infinity hull of these Li's. <clears throat> and by the way, if L is a vector field, this is exactly I yes, Fi's are uh, smooth functions. Wait, I mean, I think everyone knows what does it mean to be C infinity for functions. Uh, yeah, what else? yeah. Uh, if L is just a vector field, then this means exactly that uh, D is in the algebra generated by L. So, and this is some sort of edge case, which we will see in the proof uh, has to be sort of taken care of. So this is, it's somehow degenerate, right? The operator, because it's, uh, it can be generated by operator of smaller degree. Okay, and, and the final definition, <clears throat> again, if I have U phi, some coordinate chart, I say that F is uh, phi separated solution. If F can be written as GH, which everyone would think, uh, such that G it depends on the first uh, K coordinates and H depends on the last N minus K coordinates, which is like very basic. And I just wanted to say to remind formal. Okay. I guess I can state the theorem down here. Oh, it's, yeah, thanks. So the theorem, main theorem. <clears throat> well, if I have a two dimensional manifold, yeah, this two dimension seems a lot, restri uh, a lot restrictive, but you'll see in the proof that it's just a way for us to guarantee a solution. Because if we do the separation, we are left with uh, ordinary differential equations, which always has solutions. So this is just a way to guarantee the solution. It works the same in higher dimensions, but you are left with a PD of, uh, with less variables, but still it doesn't have to have a solution. <coughs> uh, I have, of course, the differential operator on some, 
on M. <coughs> and I have L, which is, um, L is simple symmetry of homogeneous degree one. It's just a vector field. Uh, like that. And important part, L does not generate D, which is written above. Okay, so this is this is the main result. Oh, okay, <laughs> conclusion. Uh, and under these uh, assumptions, uh, we know that D separates in some coordinates, which are actually generated by L because it's a vector field. Okay, so let me clear it, and then I will state the proof at least briefly. So the proof. <clears throat> uh, I mean, the proof is fairly easy. <clears throat> so just to recap, uh, we have some differential operator and some simple symmetry, which is just a vector field that does not generate D. Well, as I said, we can create uh, some coordinate chart uh, <clears throat> from the L, because L is a vector field, so we can take the flow and for Benio's guarantees solution. And now in these coordinates, L looks exactly as dx1, right? Because it's uh, it was defined in this way. Yeah, I have two coordinates. I'm just using, I mean, the Frobenius states that if you have K, uh, vector fields such as the commutator is inside the distribution, you get the other coordinates. So you don't have the map? Uh, well, I have. I I'm using the Frobenius to create the map. Uh, I think you don't have to take something from the color. Yeah, but I mean, I have one vector field. Okay, I take a point where it's, well, L is not zero. So I have a linear independent, yeah. I mean, is, that, is it clear? What I mean, okay. <clears throat> okay, and now when we re rewrite the uh, notion of being symmetry, it basically means that zero is the X1. But if you uh, write this commutator out, you see that uh, maybe I have some uh, differential operator on this U. <laughs> and if you write this commutator, you see that it's just the derivations of the i's and the xi, right? The other terms disappear. And this must be zero because it's a simple symmetry. So, and these coefficients are determined uniquely. So you get that the x1s of fi's are zero. And now you can take a convex neighborhood around the point where L was initially non-zero, such that uh, <coughs> these uh, Fi's are not dependent on the first coordinate. Sorry? Yes, exactly, yes. So now if we write, sorry, D on, <coughs> lambda x1 times h 
such that h is uh, the function of last, well, in this case, the last variable, but I work, I'm writing this in general way. So last uh, n minus one variables. <clears throat> I can see that this is exactly E lambda plus one times, I'm gonna write like this. This is some over i, some over j, d one, d two, right? I mean, in it's just the same way as we did before. We just replace the dx ones with lambda i's because we have taken the exponential out, and we know that these f i's are not <clears throat> the not dependent on the first variable. So I, I can actually write there's functions of x two. <clears throat> yeah, and this is. Basically, it's that's the main idea. Uh, you can see that now this is a differential equation in uh, less variables. If you want, if we want to find solution of this thing, uh, there are just some, uh, ordinary. yeah, ordinary. Sorry, ordinary. Yes, because it's uh, for one variable only. <clears throat> and now you can. There are some just uh, technical difficulties right now. The first thing is, well. Uh, what if there are no dx2s? So this is just a function and it doesn't have a kernel. Well, this won't happen because L does not generate D. It was this assumption for. Uh, I mean, it can happen that the, for example, if there is some non-zero F on, I don't know, K floor, uh, it may happen that we have chosen such a bad lambda that this will be a zero. Well, this we can take off, uh, they can take care of by just, changing the lambda because there are at least uh, at most finite number of lambdas that one won't work. And all these things can be taken care of. Uh, by the way, if this, so <clears throat> this is the D prime. Uh, no, I mean, I just need that it has at most finite number of zeros. Yes. So I don't need the theorem of algebra. Yeah. So this is the D prime and all this that is left to do is find some solution. I don't know, H zero of D prime, which is uh, always possible because we are in two dimensional case. But as I said, if we are in more dimension, this is just another uh, PDE that can be fine, uh, can be solved. Uh, by the way, that's important thing. Uh, if these F are non-zero on a, for uh, dx2 and higher. This means that the kernel of this operator has dimension two or more. And this means that we have, we can find a non-constant h. So this actually, this procedure actually guarantees a solution which is non-constant, but it also uh, non-trivial functions in each variable. This is truly a function of one variable, not just a constant. And this is for the other one, right? I mean, the, yeah, the statement is that, This is a separated solution, and this is then a non-trivial uh, function. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. The rotation, yeah. And that's actually it. And actually, yes, this this provides the separation in Cartesian coordinates. They are just, the, they are the equivalent coordinate systems, let's say. And this one, if we use this theorem, uh, provides a separation in polar coordinates. Yes, uh, I can actually write it. Well, uh, I, I mean, I've already uh, written it. I'm not sure where it was. But in the polar coordinates, you are left with something like um, you know, dr squared plus one over r. 
in R plus lambda squared over R squared plus some omega, right? That was just, that's the uh, Laplace in polar coordinates when we have re replaced d theta with lambda. And because you said Helmholtz, I added this omega. Well, and you can see actually this is a uh, equation for Bessel functions that's after some modification. And so you get the exponentials in the theta and in R you get Bessel functions and it's a separated solution for the Helmholtz equation. Yeah, I'm, I'm done actually. I can show you some examples if you want, but views of this technique, but that's the main idea. So I guess I can end here. Okay, so let's, uh, if we finish, let's continue. Let's go to in time, even we have a lot of interesting questions. So, um, uh, so thank you very much, Stefan. Yeah. So the, the, the one thing I would like to ask you, so why you know that you can admit in your definition that the chi does not depend on any degree and in the classical definition, they had has such a restriction. So that means that the, uh, why, uh, what is the diff, uh, how to say what this uh, uh, you discover? So, so you're asking why I doesn't need uh, the yeah. restrictions of the and degree? Need, yeah. yeah, I mean it's mainly because uh, I work only the with. If you look at the theorem, I'm only using the simple symmetry, so I'm actually using the zero on the right side. Uh, so actually. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean by degree? I mean, uh, if I say the g, g equals zero, if I have a simple symmetry. The, the, you only, so g zero, that means the, the, the degree on between zero. Yeah, no, the order is, yeah, the order is zero. It, basically, it means that the operator commutes with d. Yeah, so it's a g, so zero on the right side. Um, so it's the passion uh, case of the classic case. Uh, no, this is generalization, but we didn't modify all. Yeah, ah. but if you want to. Yes, uh, there are some. So that means that uh, you have the more general definition. But yes. do you have, uh, so that is the theorem is the only for. But the theorem is the theorem is only for Jesus. It's, the theorem doesn't use the symmetry uh, in a general uh, general way. But. Yeah, but. Uh, Yes. In classical case, they consider more general case. Yes, I mean, but they don't have precise answers. Yeah, I mean, if I may, <laughs> if I may comment yeah. on that, uh, if you read, for example, the Miller, uh, he requires the G to be, well, he doesn't say a definition, but he implicitly requires G to be of a lesser degree. And the point is that he's using the second order symmetries in order to show that there are no more coordinate system in which it separates. So for example, in the Helmholtz in two dimensional, you can find in Miller's book that uh, there are only four coordinate systems and he's using the second order symmetries, which I didn't use. So that's why I didn't require such strict definition. And but he works only with Helmholtz and Laplace. He doesn't work in general differential operators, which is uh, what we have done. Yes. 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 Yes, that's actually, yeah, that's actually true. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I didn't realize it. yeah, 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 right, yeah, right, exactly. So, this is the point. I mean, the highest order in commutator must cancel. If it's differential operators, the highest order terms must cancel. In the bracket. Yeah, yeah, in the bracket. Yeah, that's right. No. So, uh, if uh, there are uh, any more questions, yeah, yeah. yes, please. Okay.
Uh, that's a good question. I think so, but I don't have the proof. I, I just I think so when I did the computations, it seems that it they must be, but I, I don't know. I can think of a reason right now why it should be the case, but I think it's, I don't think you can have anything more than universal algebra of these simple symmetries, but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. No more questions. So let us uh, thank the speaker again here yeah? and uh, we close our seminar today.